and welcome to First Chapter Friday, where I read a chapter of a book you just might want to finish. My name is Kathy, and I'm a librarian at the Children's Library in Palo Alto. And in case you're watching this during August or September of 2020, um, this is a time when we're doing Palo Alto Reads. The whole city is reading one book. Um, this time, it's The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. And the main topic of it is institutional racism that is actually in some of our laws. Not as much today, but still remnants of it and the effects that it had on people. So I'm trying to pick some books uh, for kids that kind of reflect that history as well. So this week's book is called Indian No More. And it's by Charlene Willing McManus with Tracy Sorrell. So what it says on the inside cover is this. Regina Pettit's family has always been Umpqua and living on the Grand Road Tribes Reservation is all 10 year old Regina has ever known. Her biggest worry is that Sasquatch might actually exist out in the forest. But when the federal government enacts a law that says Regina's tribe no longer exists, Regina becomes Indian no more. Overnight. Even though she lives with her tribe and practices tribal customs, and even though her ancestors were Indian for countless generations. Now that they've been forced from their homeland, Regina's father signs the family up for the Federal Indian Relocation Program and moves them to Los Angeles. Regina finds a whole new world in her neighborhood on 58th place. She's never met kids of other races and they've never met a real Indian. For the first time in her life, Regina comes face to face with the viciousness of racism personally and toward her new friends. Meanwhile, her father believes that if he works hard, their family will be treated just like white Americans. But it's not that easy. It's 1957 during the Civil Rights era, and the family struggles without their tribal community and land. At least Regina has her grandmother, Cheech, and her stories. At least they are all together. Okay, let's get started. Um, one thing important about this book, the author very kindly puts in a glossary with some of the Indian words that she uses along with pronunciation help, which I found very helpful. Here we go. Chapter one, The Walking Dead. Before being terminated, I was Indian. Now, I certainly don't mean I was killed off or anything. It was 1954. The United States government didn't do that anymore. They just filed away our tribal roll numbers, erased our reservation from the map. What were our tribal roll numbers? They were the numbers the tribe assigned to its citizens and used by the federal government to see who belonged to the tribe. So my number verified that I was Regina Pettit, roll number 3669, daughter of John Pettit, roll number 858, granddaughter of Maud Pettit, roll number 25, and Sid Pettit. Roll number 18. And that's what made you Indian to the U.S. government. Numbers. Even after all that counting, the government chose to terminate us. I really don't know all the reasons why, but my chich, my grandmother, said this much. Termination means we're the walking dead. Now I ask you, how can we be dead if we're still walking? I'm going to read more than just one chapter to get you more into it. So, chapter two, res life. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me start at the beginning. I was born on the Grand Ronde Indian Reservation, just over 30 miles west from the state capital in Salem, Oregon. I had lived there all my life. I didn't know any way to live other than as an Umpqua Indian. My family was Umpqua. I was Umpqua. That's just how it was. Living on the res, I played outside with my younger sister, Pee-wee. Her given name was Teresa, but nobody except her school teacher ever called her that. We ate wild blackberries and plucked blue lark sparks without any adults watching. Ours was a small reservation compared to others in Oregon. My people didn't bother the whites that lived around us. Our res owned a cramped trailer that housed our health and dental clinic, a post office that used to be someone's house, and an everything you need from canned beans to carpenter nails store on the corner of Highway 22 and Grand Ronde Road. My elementary school was painted yellow and we had an old cemetery down the road. 
Our ancestors were buried there, like Chuck Tim Tim, my grandfather, as well as Daddy's five-year-old sister Bertha, who died from the flu epidemic of 1934. Down from the cemetery was the Pettit family house. Our house, with chipped white paint and warped boards, was surrounded by acres of tall grasses, plots of fragrant mock orange, and a forest filled with chirping squirrels and robins. We had three bedrooms, a living room, a kitchen, a mudroom, and a newly built bathroom with an indoor toilet. Getting a toilet inside was one of the happiest days of my life. When I was little, I dreaded stepping off the back porch to the outhouse before bed. It was too close to the woods. Daddy would have to coax me to go out. But, Daddy, I'm scared. What about Siyaku? I'd peer out into the woods as Daddy grinned. Old Sasquatch won't bother you. First, he's shy. Second, he's over six feet tall and smells like a wet dog. And third, well, if he does bother you, you must have been misbehaving. I wasn't too sure about the shy part. Regardless, my trips to the outhouse at night were few and far between and extremely brief. Daddy's cousin Harlan's house was just a half mile from us. Cousin Harlan and Daddy were really close, like brothers close. They talked story all the time, especially about World War II. It was right after Pearl Harbor, Daddy began, when I conned Harlan into joining the Navy with me. We both needed to get off the res before we got into any more trouble with the law. He meant that the way they were going, jail would be their next residence. According to Cousin Harlan, it was a rainy Sunday summer morning when this big bus came barreling down the road. It squealed to a stop, splattering mud everywhere right in front of the Grand Run Community Center. Then the Indian agent jumped off and said, Any man who comes on this bus will be guaranteed three meals a day, clothes on his back, a place to sleep, and a paycheck. All he has to do is get on this bus. And you got on the bus? asked Pee Wee. Well, yeah, Cousin Harlan said. Lots of young guys from the res took advantage of that deal. John and I were no exception. Hey, we pounced on that bus like a rabbit jumping onto a snare. After everyone came aboard, Daddy said, the bus blew off the res, zipped down Highway 22, and didn't stop until it was in front of an Army recruiting station in Salem. But I told Harlan that I didn't want to join the Army. You get shot at there. So I convinced him to sign up for the Navy. They promised anyone who joined them would see the world. Yeah, but they forgot to tell us that the world was made up of three-fourths water, Cousin Harlan said. Then they both howled, holding their coffee mugs in the air. After the war, Daddy and Cousin Harlan still did everything together. They both got married and worked for the Long Bell Lumber Company and its mill up in Longview, Washington, on the Columbia River. Daddy sometimes stayed away from home for weeks on end, but he didn't mind. It was a job that paid money. He had a family to support. That's what he cared about. When Daddy's big frame stomped home on those rare weeks off, he'd brush out wood chips stuck in his buzz-cut black hair. Mama usually had a steaming pot of seasoned deer meat, potatoes, carrots, and onions, and salt to gravy stirred up in the old wood stove. She'd greet him in the kitchen. Dinner will be ready soon, she would say as she checked the biscuits in the oven. Daddy would take a whiff of the stew and then grab Mom around the waist. You're the prettiest girl on the res, and I'm the handsomest guy. How about a smooch? She'd shove him off and threaten him with a wooden spoon and a smile. Johnny, you pet it. The girls are watching. Mama didn't care for showing affection in public. No, we're not, Pee Wee would say, giggling from the kitchen table and drawing pictures to decorate the walls. Mama wasn't an Indian, by the way. She was Portuguese from the Azores. But with dark brown eyes and hair, she didn't stand out. Everyone on the res called her the Portuguese woman, not by her nickname, Kate, and definitely not by her real name, Katerina. If that bothered her, she didn't say so, and for a Portuguese woman, that was pretty hard to do. Best thing of all was that Chich lived with us. Most Grand Ronde hams had three generations in one house. Each night, Chit combed my long, dark hair, saying, Never cut it. It's a powerful part of your umqua identity. When we cut our hair, it shows everyone that we are mourning the death of someone close to us. That always made me think of Choop. He lived with us, too, until his big heart attack. Since the res doctor only visited the clinic two times a week, Choop died on a day when the doctor wasn't in. He died before our tribe was terminated, so he was still Indian when he was buried.
Troop's funeral was over at St. Michael's Church with a big giveaway afterward just up the road at the community center. Giveaways help family and others in the community remember a person or an event. For Troop's giveaway, smoked salmon, homemade breads, and every kind of berry pie covered long tables. Another table held homemade doilies, tablecloths, and extra pies as giveaways. Some elders and those close to Troop received gifts. Everyone in the community gathered at the center and shared a meal. The grown-ups visited while us kids ran around the hall. From the wake to the burial, there was a lot of singing. Our voices helped Troop get to the next place, making sure he felt comfortable and stayed there. There in the hall, as daylight faded, an elder pounded the table with his hand flat. And then he'd pound again and again. A rhythm sprang from the pounding, a drum beat. Three poundings, then a pause. Three poundings, then a pause. Soon the other men in their dress slack shirts and ties sat down at the long table and joined in. We kids stopped running around. Then the elder wailed, I the other men joined in, repeating this and singing a song I'd never heard. I leaned over to Chich. My curiosity peaked. What are they whispering? I whispered. Or what are they singing? I whispered. It's an honor song, sweetie, for your troop, Chich said. How do they know all the song? They heard it many times before. It's been passed down from family to family. Daddy leaned over too. We used to sing this song during the day. But now we do it at night. Why? I asked. The Indian agent told us to stop, frighten the next door neighbors. He leaned even closer, thought we might be on the war path. Then he winked. Daddy seemed to find everything funny. Later that night, we had a ceremony to burn Choop's clothes and other items not given away. It was a special time. Our family visited Choop every Sunday after mass. His old beat up logging cap sat atop the cedar board above his grave. Most of the graves had cedar boards covering the plot so family and friends could place items on them that the dead had enjoyed when alive. Cheech had placed some cattail dolls on Bertha's board. Strolling around the cemetery, I would check out all the neat stuff on the graves, like silver thimbles on top of Aunt Ivy's or metal carving tools on top of Uncle Joe's. But there was no taking or removing anything from the cemetery. Cheech and other elders taught us that anyone who disturbed and respected the spirits like that would put themselves at serious risk. I didn't doubt that for a minute. Things changed at home after Troop died. Cheech had her long, silver-streaked hair cut short in a ceremony to mourn Troop. Each chilly gray morning as she twisted peewees and my straight dark hair until two lengthy braids, we missed hearing Troop stories. After she finished, she would put on her well-loved yellow apron and make us hot, clumpy oatmeal with dried huckleberries and cups of coffee mixed with lots of canned carnation milk and sugar. Then Pee Wee and I would head outside to play or head over to the Indian Agency School. Daddy would hitch a ride with Cousin Harlan to the mill while Mama whisked around down the road for her waitress job at the Res Diner. And Cheech, well, she sewed, made pies, and did whatever else grandmothers did. If I got up early enough, I joined Chicha on the porch to Wawa Tha Hayam Kabit Song, or greet the day. We'd sit together, she with her coffee and me wrapped in my favorite wool blanket, waiting for the morning sun to reach Spirit Mountain. Remember, the mountain is sacred to our people, she would say. It is a good sign if you see Sahali Tahi, so pay attention. I'd keep my eyes peeled and sometimes I'd see a great bald eagle soar beyond the pines, grateful to call Grand Ronde home, just like me. One more chapter. Chapter three, divisions. The year I turned eight, I knew change was coming to Grand Ronde. The res buzzed continuously with reports. Almost every night that winter, our family hustled over to the community center for what were called informational meetings hosted by the Indian agent. Even the elders' Friday night bingo was canceled, which almost never happened. I never understood everything being said, as kids usually ended up inside the large community pantry playing with old toys or outside on the church's playground with a merry-go-round and swings. Even when it rained, I preferred to be outside with my cousins, but that day it was cold. Indians shouted at the white men in suits or at one another. 
Angry words flew, threats of battle. I cowered near the pantry window. No, we won't leave our homes, and one Indian said. We do not want your money, said another. You cannot trust the government, Chich said. They are offering us a better life, said Daddy. His view did not seem to be shared by the others. Frustration poured from the community room. Indians against the government, family member against family member, old against young. I stared out the window at the soggy playground outside. I felt like this was what the Indian agent must have wanted all along, us fighting. At home, I asked Daddy what the meetings were about. Why was everyone so angry? The government just doesn't want to be in the Indian business anymore, he said, leaning back in his chair. Mama said, someone from the Bureau of Indian Affairs had the nerve to say, Kate, you might as well get used to it. Then she struck a match to light her second cigarette with the first one still burning in the ashtray. The Bureau of, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or the BIA for short, was the government agency that sent those white men in suits to tell us Grand Ronders that we were about to be terminated. Our old schoolhouse had just been painted a new coat of yellow. You would think if the government painted it, they were planning on keeping it. I didn't understand what they wanted with all our old buildings anyway. I'm worried about Troop. What about our cemetery? I asked, looking over at Chich. They have promised to not take our cemetery from us, she said. But I didn't know if I believed it. But maybe the government wouldn't sell a graveyard anyway. The fighting at the community center didn't change anything. Our tribe was against termination, but the BIA superintendent lied and said we were for it, claiming we took a vote. But no vote was ever taken in Grand Ronde. But I didn't know any of this had happened. Spring came, then summer, and my birthday. I was starting to think we'd be left alone, but we weren't. What's really cool about this book is it's semi-autobiographical. The, the main author, um, Charlene Willing McManus, she was one of the Indians who was terminated. And so at the end of the book, it gives you a lot of information about the actual Indian tribe. But you'll want to read it to hear what happens to um, the girls and this family as they become terminated and then what do they do next. Thank you so much for joining me for First Chapter Friday. I hope you'll do it again sometime. Goodbye.